welcome. Um, it's really good to see you all here on this beautiful, beautiful beginning of spring um, Saturday. Um, I'm going to take a deep breath because I've been going up and down the elevators a lot. <laughs> um, welcome. I'm going to start um, with a brief, reading a brief excerpt um, from an uh, English writer named Dugald Hine that I really admire. And this is from his uh, recent book, At Work in the Ruins. And I'm reading it because this is actually the first, this is the first Living Future Saturday event that we've had where both of our presenters have been artists. So I was thinking about this. When artists are brought into projects about climate change, the assumption tends to be that they will make something that helps deliver the message a poem, a play, a film, a pop song that will wake people up to the depth of the trouble that we're in, that will stir people to action or bring about behavior change. If this invitation is accepted, the result is usually a failure, both as art and as message delivery, because this is not how art works. As the Swedish playwright Anders Duis put it to me, quote, our job is to complicate matters not to be difficult for the sake of it, but to do justice to the strangeness and the messiness of life in a world like this, and to create the kind of space in which stories come alive. So, welcome everyone to Living Future Saturdays. I'm Sarah Rose Nordgren, I'm the Director of School for Living Futures, which is an experimental interdisciplinary organization here in Durham dedicated to creating new knowledge and possibility for our climate changed future. Um, I'm going to invite everybody to take a breath and be present here in the space together. And I'd like to express my gratitude for everyone who's helped make this event possible and the efforts and synchronicities that have allowed us to be in this room together this afternoon. Um, thank you to James and Christy for sharing your work and wisdom with us, uh, to the American Underground for hosting us, and to the small and mighty SFLF team. Um, please silence your devices if you haven't already. Feel welcome to make the experience comfortable for your body in whatever way you need to. The restrooms are if you walk to the right here and just follow the hallway around in a sort of horseshoe shape. If you follow the hallway, you will arrive at the restrooms and that there's also um, a water fountain there. Um, um, I think that's all of the notes. Before we commence hearing from James and Christy, um, Krista is gonna come up briefly and um, sort of uh, wrap up our apples and waffles game. <laughs> oh yeah, and the microphones, just so you know, are not for room sound, they're for the live stream. So. Yeah. Hi everyone, so I'm curious to hear people's list. Um, what was obliterated from the world forever and um, what what item did we land on ending, keeping? Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So the game we started with the choice between apples and waffles. And whatever you choose, the other item is ceases to exist from the world forever. And so they're going to share some of the things that we let go of from the world. OK. Uh, waffles, Neil Diamond, <laughs> <laughs> apples, swimming pools, poetry, kittens, lakes, music, and finally, whale vertebra fossils. OK. Oh exist no longer. They are gone. Gone, okay. And what about <laughs> getting rid of Neil Diamond is gone. <laughs> mm. Apples, I think, probably were, oh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Because 
But if, oh yes, right, yeah. Apples survived a couple and then. But somebody else brought them up later. Yeah, because the first person chews waffles, so apples survived. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Gone from the world are waffles, bicycles, apples, celery, <laughs> afternoon naps, uh, sneakers, cell phones, elections, cherry blossoms, indoor plumbing, butterflies, bees, vehicles, electricity, clothing, poultry. Fish, schools, oceans, skyscrapers, and people. Okay. No people. No people. Okay. Oh, it's surviving. It yeah. Is it surviving or trees? Trees survived at all. Can I have your list also? Is that okay? Steve, did you say what survived? No, he forgot. Nothing survived. Yeah. Okay. Was it fine art? Oh. Okay, nice. Fine art survives. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm wondering if we can all take a moment. I'm going to maybe not read the whole list again, but just a couple of things. And I'm going to ask you all just to individually kind of close your eyes and try to imagine like living a meaningful day without some of these items. Um, here we are with um, a list of things that in some ways we were able to contribute our sort of choice and decision making into, but we also kind of had to live with the effects of other people's decisions. Um, so what, so just close your eyes for a second, take a deep breath. What would a day look like without Neil Diamond? <laughs> <laughs> Swimming pools, kittens, music. <laughs> <laughs> um, without electricity, without cell phones, without fish, without schools, what would a meaningful, perhaps beautiful day look like? without lakes, without indoor plumbing, <laughs> without bicycles, thank you. So before um, I introduce James, I have a quick um, call to action, which was sent to me by Samantha Croft, Noose Riverkeeper, that she wanted me to share with everyone. Um, she says, I want to put on your radar an important action opportunity at Monday's upcoming Durham City Council meeting in which the council will decide on the Olive Branch Reserve rezoning proposal which is a proposal to convert 87 acres of forested land in Southeast Durham's Lick Creek watershed into over 280 town townhomes. If you are able to lend your voice at the council meeting on Monday evening, we would love for folks to sign up to speak on behalf of water quality and responsible development in Southeast Durham's struggling Lick Creek watershed. Sound Rivers is very concerned about this proposal due to its location in a significantly environmentally degraded area the proposal is directly adjacent to Martin Branch, the most heavily sediment polluted creek that we have documented in the entire Noose River watershed. We've documented extremely high sediment from construction related runoff in Martin Branch and how that dirty water flows into Lick Creek and makes its way into Falls Lake downstream. This proposal would also create more car dependent sprawl in an environmentally degraded, degraded area that is devoid of local institutions that are a critical part of the definition of mixed residential neighbors as defined by 
defined by Durham's comprehensive plan. So um, I'm going to put this piece of paper on the back table, and if you are interested in receiving information about that in order to sign up to participate, you can put your email address there, and I will forward you the link to, to sign up for that. Um, I will do that in a moment. Okay. So I am very pleased to introduce our first guest today, which is the artist James Coyle, who's Am I pronouncing your last name right? Okay, good. Whose work I first encountered last year when Liz Gage, executive director of the Durham Art Guild, introduced us. His large-scale paintings depicting environmental damage took my breath away, while his humility, quiet intelligence, and generosity drew me to want him as a friend. James is also one of the three artists creating work for the Future of Water, a speculative art show that the School for Living Futures has commissioned to explore creative solutions and imaginings for the future of our local watersheds. I invite all of you to come view James's work along with the work of, Duke, of Lucas Brown and Patrizia Ferreira in that ex exhibition, which will be May 11th to 28th at Durham Art Skills Golden Belt Gallery. James also has a solo show going on right now um, that he will probably mention to you that you should also go see. James Coyle is an artist, teacher, and father based in Durham. His work can be found in many public and private collections throughout the United States and Europe. He received a BFA from the Savannah College of, School of Art and Design and continued his education at the Art Students League of New York. While in New York City, James spent six years working as the assistant to muralist Richard Haas. James has exhibited his work widely, including the Green Hill Center for North Carolina Art, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Tokyo, Japan, Cam Raleigh, Bobby Red Project Space, Brooklyn, New, uh, New York City, and Leslie Heller Workspace, New York City. His solo museum exhibition at Waterworks Visual Arts Center in Salisbury, North Carolina runs from January 8th through May 17th. And one of the paintings in this exhibition was included in the fifth National Climate Assessment published by the U.S. Global Change Re uh, Research Program. Welcome, James. Presenter view. Hello. Oh, thank you. This clicker? Yeah. Oh. Oh, this clicker. Oh, okay, awesome. Thank you. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Sarah Rose and Krista for this lovely opportunity and for everything that you are both doing for this, uh, for this environment and for the community here. Um, I'm very happy to, to be here to share a little bit about my work and um, some of the lessons I've learned over the course of doing this. Um, I guess what I'm going to do is just kind of do a brief run through of kind of life and uh, art events and then I can kind of go back a little bit and talk about some of the takeaways and things that I've learned through, through this process of creating art about the environment. Um, okay, so I think I skipped one, no I didn't. I guess, I, um, yeah, this is just to show that, um, yeah, I come from a long line of of artists. This is my granddad painting, and that's my mom painting, and then me painting in France with my granddad. And um, so, yeah, I was always encouraged as a, from a very young age. This I came about as a kind of a fun thing to just throw in because I was looking for older works, and I was like, oh my gosh, I have a self-portrait from when I was seven <laughs> of my family. <laughs> Um, so these are some very early painting watercolors that I did in um, New Haven, Connecticut when I was 10 years old. Mm -hmm. And um, I included them just because I just wanted to sort of show that um, each of these has a sort of human element in them. And I've, you know, I've spent a lot of time painting all sorts of different things in my life. But um, I have noticed over the years that there's a different level of appreciation for work that has something human in it. And if you just have like a beautiful scene of nature, it's hard, it's, it's surprisingly difficult, I think, for some people to kind of connect with it. 
And I, it's interesting for me because I just like to go out and paint. I feel like a lot of the reasons I became an artist in the first place was because I just like to, it's a very meditative, health, healthy experience to go out and, in, and paint. And I think that, um, you know, that's, to me, it seems like that would be a no-brainer for anybody to just see a painting and say, oh, I, I like nature, I can appreciate this, but it's not always the case. Mm -hmm. So um, I just, I point that out because I think that this is, it's relevant to have a human element in, in your work. Um, this is jumping way ahead, but I'm going to try to wrap up this sort of tangent in a way that will hopefully make sense at the end. Um, I was born in California. We lived in Connecticut for 10 years, and then I moved back to California. And I had a bit of a troubled youth. And so for the first five years of my um, teenage years, um, mostly due to sort of, uh, well, my, my mom and my sister and me, we lived in California. We just basically, um, she, she kind of had her own mental health issues and we didn't have a lot of supervision. And so I particularly was sort of self-destructive and got in a lot of trouble such that at the age of 16, I got um, kidnapped in the middle of the night by two ex-football players and whisked off to Western Samoa um, for a year. <laughs> so from for the year, 16 through 17 years old, I was in a uh, youth rehabilitation program in Samoa which is very odd and people usually are pretty surprised to hear that because I haven't actually spent a lot of time talking about this in my life because it was a part of my life that, I mean, it was, it was a very difficult time leading up to that and um, I'm actually writing a graphic novel about it right now. Um, and, you know, because I went and it was such a, it actually worked for me and I got so much out of it, I didn't really want to highlight the crazy times before and it's even something that as much as it resonated with me and I, Samoa was deep inside of my heart. I didn't really know how to talk about it, really. And I didn't even know how to put it into my art, quite frankly, because it's kind of, I don't know. I, it, there's also issues of cultural appropriation that I was struggling with. And how do you, I'm not going to go painting like Samoan traditional artwork or something like that, because it's not my culture. And yet it did feel partly like my culture, because I was at a very influential time in my life right then. And it really saved, saved me, I would say. So um, it's interesting how it's taken me a very long time to kind of circle back around to it, but these are three pieces out of many, many that I did while I was there, when I was 16, 17 years old. And so uh, that's where I lived, on the, in those little portables there. But the other reason why this is significant, and the reason I chose these three, are because they all show the beach area of Saluafata Bay, which is the village that I lived in, of about 300 people. And um, this bay, where, this, where the beach is there, is one of the hardest hit by climate change on the island of Samoa, and um, there is no beach there anymore, basically. And it was actually where school kids from all over the island would get bused to if they'd take a school trip. That's where they would go because it was, had the best beach in the, this, isn't, this little strip here isn't exactly the best part of it, but around the bend was a lovely beach, and there is no beach there now. There's like the entirety of Samoa is basically, on the, at least on the north side of the island, is seawall because it's just been eroded away, and most of it's right up against the road. So you're just like, there's, it's, a, it's also an island that goes up pretty fast. It's not like Fiji and some of the other islands that have a lot of flat agricultural land, you know. It's pretty, it goes up fast. So you're, a lot of it, you're driving along this little tiny bit of road that it's not much between you and the, the hillside. It goes straight up a volcanic cliff. So um, it's interesting. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that too when I'm sort of summarizing all the, some of the things I've, I've learned. But one of the interesting things is that this is the location of a seawall that has been built, which typically are extremely detrimental to the environment. And because usually you put a jetty out and it just, because there's erosion, you want to keep your sand, and then it just offsets your problems to the neighboring beach. Um, but I was researching Saluafata, this little tiny village in Samoa, and it came up on this interesting report, scientific report, highlighting three seawall examples that were deemed successful. And this one was in part because of the fact that it was, there, there were a lot of factors. One of them was that there was so much local input on it uh, about how to build it, and they were involved in the building it. The rocks were from their community. Um, and it was a, it's a living wall. They planted mangroves in it. So, and I think it could be somewhat geographical, but it's kind of a bay, and so, um, it may have, in fact, been more to do with the fact that it sort of like created a bit of a more of a harbor kind of a situation rather than like a jetty that would just sort of offset the problems to the neighboring mm -hmm. community. But I find that interesting that, you know, 
here's this place that's so significant to me, and, and you'll see also this, the, the, the climate report that was referenced earlier that I had a piece in is a painting I did. It's really pretty much the only painting I've ever I had done up until that point that was about Samoa, and it was about sea level rise. And so I find it interesting that that's the location of one of the only, the other, and of, of the three, the, one of the other ones was in Apia, the capital of Samoa, and that's because a big typhoon came through and washed out their market, and they put in a seawall, and that was deemed successful, not as much because of the retention of the land that it provides, which it does, but it's also become a bit of a community meeting spot, and so it serves a more social um, purpose, which is an interesting thing as well. Um, so anyways, I come back from Samoa, and I traveled around a bit, but, and I, I went to Alaska and worked up there, uh, but I was very much drawn to the contrast of nature and humanity. Um, so it's not necessarily just like a human element, but I do like the, um, the juxtaposition of sort of industry with nature because it is a, it's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a nice foil for it. So I went to, then went to college, and um, I did skip over the fact that I, I moved to Vermont after Samoa, and I had a very influential art, art teacher in high school. Um, and so he, when I was there, it was a lot of, lot, mostly it was wintry, as I remember it, because the summertime I was in the school, and um, he would pick, us, pick me up in the morning before school and take me landscape painting. And he had eight kids, so it was saying something. He, he really took me under his wing, and one of the things that I painted the most was a local um, dry cleaner that always had like steam billowing out of it. And so I think I just naturally learned to paint landscapes by looking at steam and it somehow just attracted me to, to that motif. Mm -hmm. So I went to SCAD, Savannah College of Art and Design. They have a lot of paper mills around there. And there's also a lovely wildlife refuge. It's just in South Carolina, but it's called the Savannah Wildlife Refuge. And you can see all these alligators in the foreground, and everything. not in this painting, but in general. And then right behind it are all these paper mills. And it's, again, it's such an interesting juxtaposition of this, these, like, these ancient creatures and this lovely nature with these mills that just, it's just such an interesting uh, juxtaposition. Um, this is another one I did back then in college. So those two, these two are from around the year 2001, I want to say, maybe. Um, so I've been doing it a while. <laughs> uh, anyways, got out, of, got out of, of SCAD and moved back to Durham briefly. This is the Eno River. These are from 2004. That little one on the left is of the West Point on the Eno. Uh, this little part here is like the dam that is there. This is a footbridge that used to be there that they took out to re-naturalize the river. All up and down the river, they've done a lot of work to kind of bring it back to its original state, um, which is great from an ecological point of view. Not so good from that view of this painting because I love that little thing of double waterfall. I painted it a dozen times or more, but it's, I'm happy they did it all in all. Um, but these are the types of paintings that I kind of did um, after, you know, these are sort of a span of a long time, but basically this is the type of thing that I often go out and paint is this sort of connection with the industry and, and nature here. So, um, in 2011, I did this big painting on the left, this triptych, it's called The Prog Progress of Mankind, and I did it for a competition in Michigan um, called Art Prize, which is a public art p competition, and the, it's kind of, it's voted on by the public, and Anyways, it doesn't exist anymore, but at the time when it started, it was like a huge prize, and uh, the key was to paint big or don't even bother because no one's going to see it. And so I did this huge thing. Um, it was also, incidentally, right around the time of Occupy Wall Street. So this painting was a lot about sort of corporate greed and people fleeing to nature for refuge, trying to outrun the, the, the pollution. And this little guy, this guy here, it has sort of one foot in, one foot out, like he's got a phone, like we need the power, but he's sort of like not unsure of what's happening, you know? Um, and it's just an interesting, uh, it was an interesting reaction because it was the Rust Belt and um, basically people were like, I bet you 50 bucks those people drove there. And I was like, well, they didn't because I made them up, but <laughs> they would have. Of course they would have because what else can you do? But that's the point of art, right? Like start, spark a conversation about it, but they weren't having it because they just were like, also it was just, uh, yeah, it was not in a good spot downtown. It was kind of outside of town, but it was, uh, it was the first time, before this, like a big painting for me was like a tiny little canvas like this. So it, it, it broke me of my fear. That's 12 feet high by 20 feet long. Um, linen. And then this one is another one that's huge, uh, that's in my show right now, 
um, in Salisbury, but that is part of a series that I've done many, many, many versions of. You'll see some more of them of like power plants, little tiny power plant with a huge ash cloud coming out of it, meant to sort of show the cause and effect. Like how can this little tiny thing have such an effect? Um, these are some drawings that are examples of this type of, of thing where these are sort of lots of different natural disasters um, being caused by the power plant. So you have like earthquake and hurricane and even atomic bomb. So it's just this idea of sort of, of um, cause and effect basically. Uh, here are some monotypes of the same sort of idea. Time flying, time to act. Um, same kind of thing. This is like little power plant. Um, nature, you know, it's like the effect on nature, right? It's how is it, like here, like the sun is being obscured. It's, it's um, and it turning into a, into a tornado. It's, so anyways, I, a lot of these, uh, I think when I go back to the, like the triptych one, for example, I really, I, I, your, your, your reading earlier, um, Sarah Rose, was interesting and it, I, it's thought provoking because I think I really was trying to like clobber people over the head with the meaning in that first one. I really, I wanted it to be propaganda. I mean, I just, that was it. It's like, you guys don't understand. Look at this. Yeah, this is what we need to be focusing on. And I don't think it was as successful as a result. In fact, I've had people come, uh, for a while I had just the middle panel in my studio. Like they were all stacked on against the wall and just the middle one was showing. And I've had people say like, oh, you should just show that one and get rid of the two side ones. And I think in a way that's tr There is an element to that. I mean, you know, there's enough, you just sense that something's happened. You don't need to necessarily spell everything out. It's just enough to know that there's something happening. And uh, by leaving something open to the viewer, sometimes that's more effective than trying to clobber someone with a meaning that they may not understand, uh, agree with, you know, especially when there are people in like Michigan, for example, are trying to find jobs. They want the smoke coming out of there because it means jobs to them, you know? Um, so it's interesting because it's hard to know how to cross these, bound these barriers and to reach people, you know? So this is the painting that is in the climate report. Um, this is about Samoa, loosely, but basically it's about sort of island, people living in island nations who are not responsible for the global sea level rise, but they're the first ones to be affected by it. So at the top there's this sort of, a, it's like they're in a fish tank basically, sort of trapped, like it's just getting more and more polluted and there's nowhere to go, you know? And um, ultimately, I mean, I kind of, uh, yeah, it, it, this, I was, I, there's a lot of reasons what got me, got, they got me to do this in the first place that, and even the meaning has sort of evolved, but it is interesting that it's a little bit more ambiguous what's going on. And as a result, every time I've shown this place, everyone has a different take. Like I showed this one um, to some people who thought, like one person saw it and was like Samoa, and I didn't have anything to do with, nothing about it said Samoa, they just called it out, which I thought was just like mind blowing that there's, you know, that they could have picked that up from it. But down here, most people think it's tobacco leaves. Oh. And it kind of depends somewhat on where, where you're from. I mean, technically there are aquatic plants from my fish tank at the time when I did this. <laughs> But, you know, they could be banana leaves and they could be, there's it's all sorts of things. So it's, it, um, anyways, uh, so let's see here. This is the climate uh, change report that has just come out. It's, it was, um, man, actually it was d done by presidential mandate or whatever um, for, by H.W. Bush, interestingly enough, which I point out because it's become such a polarized issue. People would say, oh, like, how could a republic, like, it's hard to even imagine a Republican president starting a, a thing like this, but they were mandated, and then a year later by Congress, they mandated, every four years, they have to come up with a report that compiles data from all, for now 14 different siloed governmental agencies and puts it into one report that gets submitted to Congress and to the White House. And so this is the fifth one, and it's the first time that they've included art in that. And uh, it's now the they just wrote to us to ask if they could like put us in touch with press people and stuff who've been asking about it. But it's the second, this gallery here, the climate one, is the second most viewed page on the entire report behind the overview of the report itself, which is huge. So it's really, it's getting a lot of traction, which is excellent. Um, and mine was like a top selection or whatever, and it represents Hawaii and US affiliated um, island, Pacific Islands. Yeah, it's, it's quite an honor, and it's very um, timely because, well, it's interesting because I did the painting a while ago, you know, and it's taken like 10 years basically for this thing to kind of catch up to the, to the times in a way, um, which I find kind of interesting, but it's also timely now because I have this show in 
Salisbury, and that is sort of one of the featured pieces in the show, so it's, it's nice timing-wise. So anyways, um, I went back to Samoa in October for the first time in 27 years, and I, it was amazing. I, had a, I got three articles written up about me. It was just like a wild, wild, amazing experience. I ended up getting, falling into this artist residency. Um, I made like, 22 paintings, I think. I taught a printmaking workshop on, uh, where we printed monotypes on paper that was made on site using invasive species, which is an operation that they have going. So there's this whole thing, article about the paper. This is about me and my little, uh, my little like printmaking workshop here. But this is about their paper, and that's of course about just me getting saved by when, my, when I was a kid. And um, it just was a very, very wonderful experience. But um, I was able to talk about the climate report and the piece, and it also kind of gave me, incidentally, some some confidence about talking about Samoa again and putting in my work because I didn't feel like I really had the right to almost before, but suddenly they were like, what are you doing? And there was this, I, w I gave a little talk kind of like this at, at this opening I had for the show and, they, and um, the, the person who, um, Stephen, who's on the left there, that lower one, when he was introducing me, he said, um, you know, Samoa saved James, but now James, maybe he'll save Samoa and I'm like, like, ah, I don't want that responsibility. Like, how on earth could I do But But what I take away from that is that it's true. Samoa has 200,000 people. It's this tiny island in the middle of nowhere, and there is no, there's nobody going to save some. No one's going there to help them, really. You know, the only reason the U.S. has any interest in them now is because strategically China's shown some interest, and now we're like, hey, remember us? But they, we forgot about them for a long time, and they don't. They they know that they remember. But the point is that I can't. I'm not going to save someone, but I can try. I can do my part to try, and I think it's important to do something. And I, and I do have that connection there. And you know, it was just a very eye-opening and wonderful experience. So um, uh, these are some of the pieces that are in the show right now. Um, I feel like. At least the two, the right and left one, the colors are all weird here, but um, they're kind of in progress in this photo because they're in the show. Like I put a bunch of seagrasses here and stuff, but this, these were done ba since I got back from, from that trip. Um, and it's a little bit more in this new direction where, so what I've sort of picked up, gleaned from the other people who work in this field in climate change within art, um, there seems to be a, a move almost across the board towards more positive messaging because if it's too dire and grim it can create apathy because people are just like oh my god i'm too and it's already people are already scared and, and fearful and stuff so um this one uh on the right it's uh people replanting the the dunes basically um this one in the middle is kind of like we don't know where the it's called traveling light which is kind of a double entendre you have the light traveling but you also it's like they're carrying something you don't know what it is but they're fleeing the scene and it's meant to kind of evoke some sort of um, sometimes like religious thing. I'm not religious, but I, you know, there are flight out of Egypt and lots of scenes throughout history of art where people are sort of fleeing something. And in a sense, it could be a climate refugee. It could be, what are the class? Is it a baby? I mean, what, are, what would you take with you if you were to flee something like this? And we don't even know what it is they're fleeing. It could be a monster. It could be a power plant. We don't know. So I'm, I think I'm trying to kind of keep it a little bit more open-ended in my art going forward. And then the one on the left is kind of just about what's lost. Like that's a Samoan fale, which is their word for a hut, you know, like a house on the left. And it's being flooded by the, by the incoming tides. So this is the last one. This is just a few like qu quick studio shot of work that what I'm working on right now in my studio. And, uh, interestingly enough, this one and this one, I don't know if they will or not, but these ones are sort of maybe going to find their way into the future of water um, because they're kind of subtle ways of talking about water. Like this is a you know, sea urchin and you've got the, our friend the sea otter over here, which is part of a balanced ecosystem. You need to have both. So if there is a future of, of kelp forests, for example, it's going to include sea urchins and uh, sea otters, and um, this one on the left is actually a, s a traditional Samoan fishing hook. And um, again, it's kind of like there's a lot of knowledge in indigenous cultures that we can learn from to help us go move forward. Part of it is sustainability and not trawling the whole the sea, of, you know, pulling everything out that we can, um, but being a little bit more 
modest in what we take and using, you know, using traditional knowledge to help us with that. Um, and so I guess uh, some of the things that I would talk would, uh, would just like to summarize were, were, I guess, come up with some hopefulness in the future is um, just about the reaction that I've had over the years from these things. Because when I first started doing them back in college, it was nobody was nobody cared about this as an issue at all, really. And in, if everybody was criticizing me for not painting abstractly, quite frankly, and why would you paint a landscape even? It wasn't even about the subject matter. It was just like, why would you paint? It's like a constable painting. Oh, I hate constable or whatever. And it's like, he's not my favorite guy either, but he's, it's, it's, he's, he's not that bad. I mean, <laughs> geez. But then, it, I, you know, 10 years later or so, when I did that painting, that triptych for Michigan, I told you the reaction. It was kind of like, get out of here with this nonsense. We want these factories, you know. And then fast forward to the show in Salisbury, and it's a pretty conservative town. They have a lot of money, um, but it's, I, I wasn't sure what to expect because you hear these stories of like um, uh, weather people getting like run out of state because they report on the weather, not even the climate, but the weather, they, you know. And out they go, you gotta, you're getting death threats and stuff. So I wasn't really sure what to expect, if I was gonna be getting death threats or something, or like, what are you doing bringing this stuff here? Um, but I, on the one hand, A, have to give serious props to the director of, of that uh, museum for bringing in challenging artwork. But also the people were really, I mean, there was clearly not a consensus about like climate and our role in it as humans and whatnot, or what to do about it. But there was definitely an appreciation of the, of the art and there was, they were able to separate the two, the art from the message. And as a result, we had some really interesting conversations, which I think that alone is like a massive accomplishment because we're in such a bubbled up society right now. Half the time, you don't even need to find yourself in a position of defending yourself or, or, or hearing somebody else's side. So art and you know poetry and the, the arts in general have that ability to get across these boundaries and to get people in a room talking about it. So I find that really interesting and hopeful and the other thing is that um, in those discussions, it, it, be, it, it, it used to be more about like, could, how could humans even have an effect on the environment? You know, and which is why I was doing these little power plants with these huge clouds, because it's like that little thing can do a lot. You know? um, that's not really the talking point now. Now it's, it's not about if we've caused it or if it's changing. It's more about how much am I willing to let the economics affect me of this, you know? It's not that I don't want, you know, everybody would like, most people would probably like there to be renewables if they felt that it was gonna be painless on the economic front. And um, even that, I think, is a better position. I take optimism from that because when, you're, when we're talking about whether or not we can even, we could even have affected the environment that way, where do you even start with that? It's like, you just, it's like your opinion versus mine. It's, nobody can really go anywhere from that. But when we're talking about economics, um, it's kind of like the human body. Preventive medicine is a lot cheaper than waiting until you've got some horrible disease and you're trying to fix it after the fact. And it's the same with the environment. Every storm that comes along, it's more and more money, billions of dollars shelling out to fix these things that aren't, it's just fixing the reparation of what's just occurred. It, and more were, are coming down the pipeline. So um, I think that if we're talking about the finances, that's an argument that is gonna prove, I think, through time to be, it's gonna be cheaper to act than to sort of act proactively than retroactively. And so that gives me some optimism as well. And then the last thing I would just like to say about just um, the type of art that I make and that others make is just that, um, you know, on the one hand, I'm very much aware of the effect that scary things have on people, and I am very much affected by these things as well. So I, I had to stop doing it. When I did that first one, that one, the triptych, I took like a five year break doing this kind of work because I just couldn't handle it. I started subscribing to 350.org and all these people, and I was just getting like this onslaught of scary, you know, horrible news, and I just couldn't, I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to deal with it. And I will say that Making paintings is cathartic, and so there's that, and that's valid enough. You don't have to, you can just do what you want because I, you know, because it, it helps me get through it. I think that's valid. 
But I also have done enough of these paintings, like some of the ones I, I did, I briefly showed of Anacortes Washington, like on the, the bottom right here. I've done a ton of paintings of, of these refineries that are in Washington and the San Juan Islands um, with the backdrop of Mount Baker in the background, this beautiful <coughs> snow-capped volcanic mountain. And it's such a contrast. Um, and most people up there paint orcas and totem poles, and they ask, why aren't you painting these things? And it's like, oh, I don't know, why would I? But, you know, but also, it's so, this is there. You can't ignore it. And people who have asked me that very question have since, when I've gone, my mom lives there, I've gone back to visit, and I've since heard them say, you know, when I, I used to paint past this, and I would just look the other way and pretend it wasn't there, and it was like this eyesore that I wanted to prevent, you know, ignore, and I've, developed an, uh, an appreciation for the beauty of it in its own way. It really is, in, its, in a weird dystopian way, it really is beautiful. It glows at night. The smoke gets hit by like an alpen glowy kind of feel at certain times of the year. It's really pretty in its own way, in a scary kind of way. So that is also interesting in, in that you, if you can make art that makes people sort of less like affected by the scary stuff in a way that allows them to kind of process it in a less harmful way or maybe even see some beauty in it so that they can tolerate and get on with their lives. That is also a good thing for art. So on the one hand, I am aware of this as an issue and I do want to start producing art that is, and I am producing art now that is more, um, I don't wanna say like rosy or positive, but it's at the very least ambiguous enough that people can kind of bring their own mindset to it. and. Um, but also not like scaring people. Mm -hmm. But I will say also that I think there's room for both. I think that you know people do need to be woken up and shaken a little bit, um, but they can also hopefully find some beauty in, the, in that discussion, whether it's in poetry or in painting or whatever, there's, there, there's the potential for beauty there while also being a little bit scary. So thank you. minute break um, and then we will commence with Christy's uh, presentation um, so see you see you in five All right, so I now have the pleasure of introducing Christy Maxwell, um, a wonderful um, poet and an elegant, here I'm gonna move that, okay. Um, a wonderful poet and elegant, generous human who I met several years ago while living in Cincinnati. Of Maxwell's poems, Sandra Simons writes, quote, like Emily Dickinson, Maxwell is fierce, twisting and turning loss itself with wordplay and wit. And also like Dickinson, language is simultaneously foreshadowed and recedes to the background, a playful ghost disquieting a room. Maxwell is the author of eight books of poems, including Goners, winner of the Wishing Jewel Prize, My My, Realm 64, Editor's Choice, or My My, Realm 64, Editor's Choice for the Sawtooth Poetry Prize and finalist for the National Poetry Series, and Hush Sessions, Editor's Choice for the Saturnalia Books Poetry Prize. She's an associate professor of English at the University of Louisville. She holds a PhD in literature and creative writing from the University of Cincinnati and an MFA in poetry from the University of Arizona. Welcome, Christy. Thank you all for being here, and thank you, Sarah Rose and Krista, um, for imagining this kind of organization. I find it just really thrilling, um, and I'm always loving to kind of see what's happening with it from afar, so thanks for including me, and James, what a wonderful um, presentation on your work, just really stunning stuff. Today I'm going to um, talk to you a little about my new book, Goners, and share some poems from it, and then kind of hopefully transition into what I'm working on now, which is kind of a shift from diminishment to 
abundance, so a different kind of work. Uh, I wanted to start off by reading a little excerpt from the note on process that opens the book so that I can establish for everyone the foundational constraint I'm using throughout the book itself. So the poems in Goners are lipograms, which is writing that excludes one or more letters. Specifically, I'm working with a variation of the beautiful outlaw. Lipograms just have really luscious names in general. Um, a lipogram that does not use the letters in the names of the endangered animals in the titles, a, vari a variation I've come to call an extinction. To explore what happens when what is endangered is instead absent, gone. The piece Cheetah, for instance, uses 21 of 26 letters, all but A, C, E, H, and T. So no the, no A, no cats, no being, no are, or were, or was, no choice, no etc. The formal strategy of the lipogram nods to global trends regarding climate change and strategies of elimination, eliminating carbon emissions, red meat consumption, plastic, and so on. I'm not writing about endangered species. I'm writing without them attempting to imagine in a linguistic landscape the ways that loss would be registered and felt or fell to be. Building off Anna Lowenhop Singh's language from the mushroom at the end of the world on the possibility of life in capitalist ruins, I've come to, the th come to think of the lipogram as an art of living on a dying planet. As a formal strategy, and in thinking of the English language as a metonym for Western hegemony, the lipogram seems like a play on or performance of capitalist ruins, a record of the fallout centered on erosive energies. Perhaps the lipogram is an experiment in ruining language, all the while reveling in its resilience, stunting the relationship between mastery and writing and creating compositional events in which we're asked to consider what's at stake in being made to slow down and what happens when we put sugar in the tank of language, raging against the machine. Uh, the first piece that I'm going to share is um, an, a, the species in the title is an akakei, which is a Hawaiian honey creeper. And the thing that kind of kept coming up time and time again when researching the endangered animal that I was kind of um, writing through or writing in the absence of was that the reason for their endangerment um, was deforestation. In the case of the Akakei, deforestation because of resort building. In the case of many of the other um, animals throughout this, deforestation because of um, animal agriculture and a desire for uh, meat. So the, the very kind of reality of a desire for dead animals and to consume dead animals has led to a proliferation of dead animals um, was really kind of present with me throughout and you might kind of hear kind of glimpses of that in some of the, the language. Akakei, an extinction. Conscious of nightly symbols forming on historic forts. How to unfold, unmoor, on mission, to join, issuing forth your country into my country, so hot, so unbound, not occupying, but simply touching. My own tropic cools, this fusing isthmus shorts, dibs on unwounding, <coughs> stop this posturing, this conviction disposition, thoroughly mining this bituminous night for lost hours, dust gluttonous, tumor thorough, pumicing our moon's bright foot, involving full-grown miners or mirrors in this whodunit, trying not to but noticing this world's voluminous booty Flossing with history's thong, with history's wrongs showing. Monolithic thoughts build phobic logics. It's on us to unbuild. Clog this porous wisdom with your good or mostly good oil. 
oil is a weird thing because sometimes we can think about oil context in which um, it has positive and negative connotations. So what a, what a strange little object. Lemur. Lemur, an extinction. Thinking is a shanty boat I go on to on this good Ohio night. What is sight to a window? What is a window's fantasy? Vision goofs, saw, saws in two. What was, wasn't. Is a scab cash that was a body savings? Is a body a ghost's citation? A ghost's stowaway past? Winnow this instant as if it is chaff. I saw a body that wasn't a body. A shopping bag posing as snow atop hay. A twin pawning a notion of two. In this imitational, a ghost fights its sinking. Not a job I'd want. What widows a window? No gazing? No noticing that goat? That hint of noon on that happy stoop? That siphon in that gas tank? That kind of aching, hatching knowing is? Uh, next, I'm going to read the first extinction that I finished um, in total, and uh, it was the one that kind of let me know that I could stick with this thing um, and move toward it. And the other thing that kind of became revealed to me as writing these is that how poetry felt like a, a, a really um, perfectly suited genre for entertaining these questions of endangerment and extinction, because questions of endangerment and extinction really are questions of value and what we think deserves to exist in the world um, and thus what we fight to preserve. And poetry kind of always has this um, contested kind of um, role in contemporary culture. Uh, and so it's always kind of bound up to these questions of um, does it does it still exist? Does it deserve to exist? What kinds of attention should we give to it? Um, so I found really working through these questions in terms of the endangered um, species in poetry felt like a really interesting alignment that kept kind of enlivening me time and again in the writing of these and really creating a lot of permissions um, in, this, in this kind of genre that's contested as a meaningful 21st century genre sometimes by people. Not by me, not by you, <laughs> not by probably a lot of you. Cheetah, an extinction. My folks sold moon yolk, forks of limp sun, no pal, so surly bombs, no ping, so surly guns, no, ju no jig, so forlorn proms. My mood is missing, my limbs no rooms for birds, your SUV runs on skim milk, syrup, piss, mows down droopy blooms, mills silky wounds in woods, giddy up womb, sings slow-mo vows for girls, boys, ponds of gold locks, blonde minnows, pounds of bling, sings sorry for killing wings, for killing floors your mop lulls. Bill, living is frigid wound or sloppy diss. Sound off. Grim voids go on, unloop. Jury of punks, of fools, growl, boo, or lip, no sin found. Look, sub grin for grim, usurp glib dominions. Prowl, pro, prowl, soil. Fond of food, you pork pigs. Poof, poor pigs in your body's slum. Sniff, sniff. Found, profound. Lungs unfold, grow. You, born proud, pom poms up. Lump sum or dim sum, when now or nil. I is form, is us plug, is solo fling, is void or ibus, is lol. Poor film, minus wow, 
missing swigs of rum, pours of gin, only moss woos rock, wood woos will, pus woos oozy, thin. Is grim, fins of wood spook us, rob our Lord's mind. Sumo king of sulk, bow down. No wig will unspy you. Your own billowing eye bills you for ussing, for eyes division. In this um, poem that I'm about to read, there's a shift in the penultimate line that you would see more readily than you might hear it. So let me alert you to it. So hopefully when we arrive at it, you will, you will catch the distinction being made. Um, I say it shifts from agro to agro. And the first agro is the prefix agro, um, as in agricultural. And the second is agro in terms of a descriptor for, um, for aggression or violence. So uh, just a little note to you here with our qui we, qui we and extinction. Flush forward to now, my harlot remnant opposed the haggle. Maybe gastronomy gave more to the world than gene therapy overall. My lament sponsored by my damages, a story on wellness's edge, forgotten as a globe the aloha ghost long ago harmed by a voyager. We gave the sea a sampler of blossom. The sea preferred none of what we gave. Bon voyage, dear anthropomorph. The fever like an earth has thawed. The onlooker weans her own eyes off the handsome loam. The go-between between growth and harvest. The besotted spore. How have we gone from agro to agro, from leaf to leaflet? The pamphleteer hankers for new goals and for more paper, fresh as wet blood. You'll likely recall that the first piece that I read you um, shares a title with the piece I'm about to read, which is Akakea, um, the Hawaiian honey creeper. Um, and this one's also called Akakea because each of the poems in the book have a companion piece. I like to think of this book as kind of my demented arc, um, playing on the homophone arc, A-R-C. Um, so, and this idea of a broken trajectory. And so each piece has a companion piece. So there are two poems for each of the animals that appear in a title. And this is to play on the story of the Ark, of Noah's Ark, and these founding mythologies about uh, the human capacity to intervene in a meaningful way um, in terms of preservation, right? And this kind of founding mythology for a lot of um, people in the US especially. Akakea, an extinction. Thought sumptuous, this skin thought hungry gown mouthing off to its own dough. This youthful body, silo still, in pounding storms, scrubbing stupidity off this truly bright moon. Bluntly put, this body is Q-tip's trough, dip in. Critics flinch, but food isn't just for mouths. Light is photo scrub innocuous potion, slough off this triumph notion. Wood should not rot, but it rots. Sorry to limbs, sorry to gibbons, sorry to hobos bound not to find north or south old stops, thorough or not. This jinx is rough, flimsy quiz, how to undo it. If now word upon word is wordsmith's tumor, if now blight is ousting frost, how to proctor unbirth, how to win this lost bowl with history surplus of wind trysting birds, blinding us from punting through the posts. My uh, very football literate friend likes to kind of point out to me when I read this poem, 
Christy, you can't score punting through the posts. <laughs> I said, well, that's a good way to win a loss bowl then, isn't it? No scoring. Um, so who's more accurate there? <laughs> Poet logic. Um, koala, an extinction. Different fires require different fixes. Wetness isn't it every time. Did Muir grieve missing species preceding densities? See their missingness, the edges misgivings, perceive the un, quinces didn't preserve. Residues extend remembering, the tide venturing in, the drying spoon, its spine, the spirit vein, deveined, deemed excess. We experienced judgment when wind whipped us, meted mischief by describing. <coughs> Fruit is a tree's sequence, ruined by the bite. Who isn't, though? Get even, Eve. Is this triggering? This being minted by suffering? The minute, but this isn't time. Try twice. The minute, the determining many, teensy thing, the seeming. Uh, I read this poem because it's one of two poems in the books that, um, again, uh, dear friends who have spent a lot of time, time with my work uh, in a very kind of generous way, um, have noted, oh, there's a slippage here um, in this koala, obviously an O shouldn't em emerge, uh, but there is an O in who isn't though, but then I kind of liked how interesting that slippage was, that kind of, um, uh, this kind of impulse to find a way to exist, it, even when um, one is kind of, um, one's existence is so radically denied that it seems kind of a foregone conclusion that one won't exist. Uh, so even in the reprint, my publisher was like, you know, you've spent more time with the book now. Is there any kind of thing that needs to be kind of um, changed and before the second printing? I was like, yeah, no, no, <laughs> not going to change it, going to keep it there. Um, but then also as a result of writing these poems, people keep sending me articles about the extinction and species revivalism. So it also just came, ke seems in keeping uh, with the way in which things happen. Um, in the world and kind of this, uh, also this kind of underlying impulse to thrive that I'm interested in. And when I was uh, at, the, at Kansas University earlier in the week with um, some ecology students and um, a paleo uh, a botanist, um, we were working on re-extinction poems in the classrooms together and it was an interesting way to kind of celebrate what's in front instead of what's not available. So I have been thinking about those things too. I'm going to read one more piece from Goners, which I do have copies of if you're interested in um, having after the reading. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about where my work is going now and read you a piece from that. Dugong, an extinction. Here's a beastless fable, a feckless tale, a sea sick with rhythm. A troll's empire has 12 fish, excess shrimp, Yesteryear's kelp palaces, plastics as empires have, at the behest, at the helm. A machete clears. Here's a fable. All the beasts keep their all. Malay sets, celestial like, a hemisphere at a time. Time is feral, after all, yet trackable. If a library is with bestiary, as a wife is with babe, prepare a lap, alter a breast, alter it. What lives is a liver, a part, a piece, a meerkat that's a clapper that strikes the mammal bell. And since, um, since finishing up this project, I've moved on to um, working to extend the work of the experimental Danish poet Inger Christensen, who has a book beloved by 
people who tend to love environmental literatures, um, translated from the Danish to the English by Susanna Neid, a longtime collaborator um, with Christensen, so a different kind of translation than sometimes we're able to have access to because the, both, both of the writers were such in constant conduct, con I'm sorry, conversation during the kind of initial writing of this book, already in the translating relationship with one another. So this book, um, Alphabet, does an interesting thing. It intersects the abecedarian, which is composing from A to Z, with the Fibonacci sequence, which is that wonderful kind of spiraling sequence, often the so-called, called the so-called nature or language of nature, right? So we have this kind of um, alphabet, kind of a, a, a metonym for human language, and then um, the Fibonacci sequence, the so-called language of nature. And so the first poem in her series focuses on A and is one line, the second poem B, two lines, then three, five, eight, 13, 21, 34, and so on. Uh, she stops her project at N, which makes sense given that N is for number and for noun, both in the Danish and the English. Um, but also um, that poem, N, should have been 477 lines based on kind of the dictates of the Fibonacci sequence, but instead ends at 321 lines. So three, two, one, a kind of countdown. Uh, so I feel like her work has always just had a kind of a very kind of aspirational urgency to it. Um, and I've always just kind of, it's a book I return to and teach. So I wanted to, I've always wanted to kind of end the alphabet, uh, which is what I cheekily say I'm doing now. I'm ending the alphabet. Um, but what I really mean is I'm continuing Christensen's project and picking up now at O, which I've almost finished, and then I'll be moving to P. And it might be a project that I don't finish in my lifetime. The, the, the sections get <laughs> a lot longer. My, my O section is 789 lines. Um, P is significantly longer. Uh, so it might be something that hopefully someone else will pick up um, after my work on it is uh, where, it, where it can go. So I'm going to read one piece from this, and then we'll move to whatever the next part is. Alphabet continued. Oh, with their diverse pollination strategies, with the mosquito need of some that revises the mosquito in one's mind, on one's skin, so often thought intolerable. Orchids exist, miniature orchids one needs a magnifying glass to observe. Wild orchids exist, risk vanishing as the insects that sex them vanish. But before they vanish, one evening, we order chili guaro and offer our takes on whether eating ceviche on a boat after delighting in swimming alongside fish, alongside filter feeding well sharks with inscrutable teeth is obscene. With its antioxidants and the joyful mountain cemented in its name, oregano exists. Oregano exists at the intersection of the culinary and the medicinal, in fields, sunny, conceptual, in areas where one might expect opportunism, the monetizing of wellness, the telling rhyme of health with wealth, the potency of access. The length of lasting, the outage exists with its estimated time of restoration, the outage and the update, the hour later, the hour again delayed. The oracle high on methane had existed, high, high priestesses, thick with utterances, tongue a churn in the mouth, the future a butter spread on the bread of consciousness, the words eaten up, but the message undigested. In a notebook, a record of ordinance tattooed on a bicep, on an inner wrist, the body a placeholder, a placemat for the cracked plate of memory, the wrong knife for managing tenderness, the contrasting plumage and onomatopoetic name of Orioles, Orioles, the site of which was once thought to cure jaundice, exist inside and outside of song. Their song, 
this song, there, our, such distinctions exist. Ostracism akin to the loss of bone mass, but that here, bone is thought to not be weakened by what's gone. Oxide daisies and osteoporosis, the celestial equator's belt, oxide daisies and the obstruction of stars, the star loss of constellations, nights thinning, never the outcry so cried out, dried up, to dehydrate, to outsmart rot, to swing for the outfield's gap, to find a way home, all that is over that continues to exist. The overcharge, the overextension, the overstock and oversaturation. Within the egg of the oviparous animal, the nourishing yolk, within the amniotic sac, the buoyancy enabling pee one makes oneself. One makes oneself exist. The good eggs, good job. With shifts in ocean temperature and seawater chemistry, existing ocean climates are vanishing. But before they vanish, one evening, we peel skins from flash boiled then ice shock tomatoes that we then core and crush and can. The putting to death of microorganisms, the strategic use of heat, one subsistence a challenge to another's existence. One of us opens the offenel and severs the stringless string beans keeping them separate from the string beans with strings. Resourcefulness exists, reuse. The original label for Ocean View brand refugee wax beans crossed out and printed over with emergency label early June peas. Now an object d'art. The upside down straw flower omitting its moisture for the woody yawn of the reef, and on occasion, multi-headed, a golden Cerberus one retrieves near the gates. The dupe of the pink and white orchid mantis should not be judged, neither the officiant referencing the script. Think like an occupation to be that which earns a living. Think like an off-season and quiet down. Think like the varnish restoring the oil painting's vibrancy, a consolidant that prevents further deterioration. The narrow want to be omnivorous, the onerous newly light. With advancements in minimally invasive techniques, open heart surgery is being bypassed when it can. But for now, while one lies open, while some contemplate the work of vessels, repair depends on disruption. The Clementine's opening reveals the coral-shaped pith, albedo harbored in the core, the vanishing reef displaced by mimicry. As an orange hue, coral keeps existing. Thank you. much, Christy. Um, so I'm going to pull a couple of seats forward for James and Christy. Um, and then my hope is that we can have some questions and some discussion. Um, Brandon, do we have the other one of these or no? Okay. Um, let me hand it over to them. So this is, you know, this is, you guys should, should just pass that back and forth. Um, thinking about what resonated for you, what questions arose for you during the presentations, what threads you might see connecting the two, 
any parts of the discussion that you feel like you'd like to carry forward. Um, I also like to ask what can we think, feel, or act differently as a result of the presentation? Sort of what, what, might, what might we be inclined to think, feel, or act differently around? Um, yes, so I have my own, maybe I'll, does anybody have a question to start with or a comment to start with? Um, as people who are creators of art and consumers of art and wrestling with these questions around climate change and extinction, I'm curious about what you see, what you all see sort of personally as art's role sort of in response to the quote that started us out. What is each of your sort of particular perspective on what does art do in this place? Sure. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I kind of alluded a little bit to it earlier, but I, I feel that it is a unique medium to, to cross over these boundaries. It's hard to find people even in the same room um, and willing to talk about these things and willing to be challenged in ways. And art does have an ability to do that. And um, whether you're looking at a painting or reading poetry or um, there's many other art forms out there that require time to, to be with it, I think that that's you, one of the strengths is that it does kind of take a little bit of time to, to take it all in and as a result you slow down and you think and it mm. opens up a little bit of opportunity for some dialogue. So I think that that's, um, that's one of the things. I also think that like from a visual perspective Sometimes visuals help people. I'm a very visual person. Mm -hmm. um, I absolutely loved hearing your your poetry, but I'm I'm excited to read it too because I, I take it in more easily through visual mm -hmm. like reading it and re and hearing it. So mm -hmm. um, I sort of feel like there are probably people out there who could use a little bit of visual stimulation to help metabolize this stuff. And it's probably true also with words for people who mm -hmm. maybe can see it but don't know how to put yeah, absolutely. Um, and point taken. I do think that uh, these kinds of venues are unique, though, because I, I found that so many of the people I encounter who are uh, readers of poetry um, just have somehow perhaps never known or um, forgotten along the way that poetry is a deeply um, oral art. <laughs> And so that kind of the sonic components of it often get muted by consumption via reading. So mm -hmm. it is kind of nice sometimes to trouble that um, with with kind of asking you to, to to experience in a different way. And I do. I mean, obviously, I align with the idea of the the slow practices of arts and how they um, resist some of the fast paced um, ways in which. Um, we're asked to move through the world as, as consumers, et cetera. Um, for me, poetry especially, I always think of poetry um, as, a, as, a, as a mode of inquiry. So it's a place where I think new questions emerge more so than um, answers to existing questions. And I think a lot of times the kinds of problems we're um, having to entertain require new questions uh, before any kind of new answer can, mm -hmm. uh, can be arrived at because obviously there's been something that's stunting um, the previous questions from motivating the kind of action that, mm -hmm. uh, that's so deeply needed. Um, so I think about poetry as a, as a habit of attention too uh, and hopefully that will, those habits of attention can translate to other modes. Mm -hmm. Um, two things are coming to mind for me while you all are, are talking. Um, one is, um, James, when you were talking about how you were thinking about your, your um, pieces becoming maybe more open-ended in a particular way and that there, there's something in the ambiguity that actually maybe allows them to connect with audiences in a way that they might not otherwise. I was thinking about um, one of our presenters last fall, Napoleon Wright II. Were you at that presentation? He's a designer and an artist and a musician. And one of the things that he said in his presentation that really um, 
that really resonated with me or has stayed with me was this idea that he was sort of trying to think in his art or in his, in his, in his design work how to get people to engage in conversations that they might not all otherwise have and that he arrived at this idea that what you're trying to do is get the, get the audience to have a conversation with themselves, right? Um, that actually th that can be the most powerful conversation that somebody can have is when you allow them to kind of have it internally. <laughs> um, and so I think that idea that, um, you know, the sort of the, like, allowing the, the piece to be more open-ended maybe is, is, is that, right? It's, it's um, instead of you sort of saying, like, this is what's going on, this is what you need to think, or something, that it's more like, oh, huh, well, what is, you know, what is actually going on there? And that maybe that's um, a powerful thing. And then I'm also thinking, um, Christy, about, um, I'm um, reading um, right now The Great Derangement by Amitav Ghosh, which is, I recommend to everybody. It's focused um, primarily on the failure of the novel to um, address climate change, and it's a little bit, it was written in 2017, so the landscape has changed in climate fiction since the, since the writing of it, but um, but he talks about the limitations of the, one of the problems of the novel being that the way that the, the novel form came to develop was that it is limited in space and time in this very specific way, so that even a, a novel that covers time might cover like a few generations or something, but that other forms, and he focuses on the novel, but acknowledges that other forms don't have that problem. Um, and I think that poetry, that one of the things that poetry actually has kind of embedded into both its history, you know, through the epic, but also in other ways, um, through maybe its, its self-awareness of its own form and its use of its, you know, use of constraint in like a very intentional way, which you're doing with the lipogram, is that the use of formal constraint actually allows these other kinds of much more sprawling um, ideas to come forward. Um, like with the, you know, with the, what you're doing with the lipogram, we have, like, you're you're able to address this huge, um, this huge topic in this very confined, you know, like restrictive way. And then also what you're doing with with um, Inger Christensen, right, that, I mean, in that book is a, a huge example. I mean, that's, I mean, it covers everything. I mean, it's basically about existence, right, but she's able to do it through this very, very, I mean, in a way, like, rigid form, and so um, I think, for me, that's resonant, I mean, as a poet myself, but it's very resonant in the times that we're living in, um, where we have all of these restrictions that we don't actually get to choose at this point. They've already been chosen for us. And so, in a way, it's like, how do we live in this like highly restricted poetic form that we've in <laughs> inherited or something? And then what are the affordances that that form gives us? Anyway, I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah. No, I love all of that. Um, and I, I definitely do have a thought about that. Um, one of my thoughts is, is that one of the remarkable kind of realities of, of working with a constraint like a lipogram um, is that what I expected perhaps going into it to feel kind of like a uh, kind of a, um, a poverty around composition um, did not occur and I and that speaks in a lot of ways to a resilience in language that mirrors kind of um, our own resilience which I think is one of the things something that we should celebrate mm -hmm. I mean resilience is I think uh, positive um, but it's also one of the things that we might sometimes need to um, scrutinize because I think sometimes inside of this project and thinking about resilience and the resilience of language and the ability to compose when a lot of times I didn't know how far I could take this <laughs> work because I didn't know what was going to happen inside of the experiment. But that kind of resilience inside of the project then started to speak to kind of resilience um, just culturally in, in how, how resilient we are, that we're able to suppress these really significant <coughs> changes <laughs> to our own habitats, our own um, et cetera, to we're able to kind of suppress the absence of this species, that species. Um, because of resilience, right? And sometimes that ability to repress and that resilience also limits action because mm -hmm. 
it's easy to sometimes forget in that suppression the urgency of mm -hmm. action. <laughs> um, so that that was something that the the kind of the fruitfulness of the constraint kept mm -hmm. strangely bringing to mind mm -hmm. for me is like I should be feeling this loss more, but in <laughs> some ways I'm like thriving in how generative what is still mm -hmm. here is. So yeah. it allows me to kind of like, I have to constantly kind of engage this question of the problematics of resilience perhaps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Do you want to uh, speak comments? To oh yeah. Do you have anything that you want to add? Um, well, I would just, I guess, say that um, that uh, with just in terms of constraint, the only thing that came to mind really initially was just that um, painting may not seem like a huge constraint as a painter. It's like, oh, that's why I'm in my element or whatever. But I, you know, the grass tends to be greener often on the other side. And being pa a painter is a lonely profession. You're usually just tucked away on your own doing it. And, you know, you have to kind of have this self-motivation to do it. And sometimes it's tempting to look at other fields like filmmakers or musicians and say, oh, look at them. They have all these other people they can do it with and keep each other motivated and stuff. And, and then you talk to a musician or somebody and you're like, oh, it must be so nice not having to deal with other people. <laughs> but, um, musician over here. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I, I will say that like, it's very challenging to come up with a still image that conveys so much information. Mm -hmm. But if you shy away from that and you go for the easy, the low hanging fruit, and the easy th approach, you don't push yourself really. And so I find, you know, it, it always comes back to this, it's a circle, circular question is, you know, like what, you know, on the one hand you're making art for somebody, right? You want them to partake in it and enjoy it and have some effect. But on the other hand, if you're not in touch with the process, it's for not, what are you doing it for? You know, and it, it, you, you probably won't be able to sustain it. So I do it because I care and I, it's like I'm, I'm invested in the process, but I, it would be easier probably in some ways to kind of think outside the box and do other ways of, of like, think of other visual ways I can present this. But I think through the limitation of sticking with two dimensional static things, it forces me to like, it's like an investigation almost. And through that investigation, you do talk to other people and you incorporate other ideas and things. And I don't know where it's gonna take me. And it's, again, it goes back to more questions than answers, but that's probably just as well because there really aren't any easy answers. But if you stick with something long enough and it's like a, it becomes a, it's like a, an arc that happens. And it does, you don't necessarily know where it's gonna end, but it does, I think, help to have some, some limitations in some ways. Back here, and then I'll come up here. That? Okay. Yeah, thanks to both of you. Those were really great presentations. Um, and I was wondering, um, I, think, I think this question kind of pertains, has a kind of relevance to each one of you, but um, uh, uh, Christy, I was thinking, I was looking at your book, and I was struck by just the, the conceit of it, just like reading, just kind of glancing through it, though again, formally, it suggests so much. Um, about extinction and loss and um, the way the pages kind of, you just keep turning the pages and are imagining this kind of like process of <laughs> progressive extinction, right? Very powerful. Um, and, I'm, and, I, and then um, I guess what I'm wondering is, is there a, is there a way in which sort of um, the, the human burden of uh, environmental crisis and the differential burden of that on different human populations is kind of part of that thinking too, or is, are those extinguished populations or at put, populations put at risk, is that kind of human element sort of part of the methodology um, and, and thinking, or is that, does that play a role in the, um, the second project or that kind of thing? Um, or just that kind of relationship between the human and the animal, I guess, is what I'm thinking about. And then, um, James, I think too, I'm thinking that you are, you're, you tend to, you were talking about how these landscapes are more interesting because they have these human elements. Um, so, yeah, I guess, I, and, and, and I'm thinking of the painting too that has the people swimming underwater. I wonder if that, what, hmm, how do, how do I, <laughs> I'm trying to think how I can phrase it, just like how that, how that human, if you're thinking about that kind of formally too, or like how, what you're, what the, thinking behind the um, relating the human to the landscape is, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah I mean, um, even if it doesn't emerge as explicit contents, 
um, I feel like, and it seems like it's been a, an experience so far for a lot of people who have read the book, is a lot of the endangered animals that I ultimately selected for the book are um, ones that I imagine um, most people who are picking up my book are going to have to gloss. Um, and what will be discovered, as I mentioned up here, is that the vast majority of the animals in the book are, um, are endangered because of human impact, uh, especially deforestation, especially bound to um, desires of people in uh, wealthier populations who then are taking the lands of, <laughs> of people in more impoverished places and destroying the ecosystems, the ability of animals that might be hunted and kind of um, practices in kind of very um, care-driven ways in uh, local populations. There's no longer the ability for even those kinds of um, interactions because these kinds of factory farms, for instance, or agricultural kind of um, kind of sites are being built that disrupt any kind of meaningful kind of connection with between non-human animals and human animals. So um, I'm hoping that that's kind of always kind of an undercurrent in the book. But the book in general kind of really um, resists uh, the pronoun world associated with humans so that when, when an I or you or he or she emerges, um, it's always kind of deeply implicated in the um, in the kind of chaos <laughs> that abounds throughout the book because this kind of human centering um, is so kind of bound to kind of um, the the sixth extinction underway. So um, I'm definitely thinking about those things. The way in which they explicitly emerge in the book, I'll have to leave other people to tell me. But it's it's on my mind. <laughs> A um, couple things that come to mind for that is uh, one is um, just the inter interconnectedness of all of, of these issues. Like um, the the environmental justice issue is tied completely up with um, racial injustice in this country and um, economic injustice in this country. And a thing that immediately comes to mind with that, which I I'm not sure yet if I'm going to do this for the future of water project, but I may do a, a touch on this element of this, pro this thing that's going on in Caswell County, just north of Hillsboro. Um, there at Roxboro Lake, it's this pristine watershed. It's a grade 2B water source for, for uh, the town of Roxboro, and it's part of the Hyco Creek watershed. There are mussels there, the James Mussel. <laughs> it's endangered because of the James River, but there's a lot of, uh, it's a really like pristine place. And um, there are bald eagles that I've seen multiple generations nesting right there. And they're putting in a 550 foot pit mine and a 300 and something foot pit mine, two of them, less than a thousand feet from the edge of this pristine lake. And, um, and guess where that is? It's in a black neighborhood with poor people and they're going to, their wells are going to dry up. And then when they when they were upset about this and they spoke up in 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 court or in the, the public hearings and stuff, um, Sunrock, the company who's doing this, and what they're doing, of course, is gravel getting gravel for your driveways. That's what they're getting for the swapping for our water. Um, they sued them. They sued the local homeowners to, with a slap suit just to shut them up so they wouldn't cause a, a fuss. And they can't afford. So they just they were just backed off, you know. And and they got. It got uh, approved. I've read the entire permit, and it's they're allowed to dump the excess water over the over the landscape into just into the forest. And they have um, there's so much water tied up in this that it's going to be 449 million gallons a year lost. Just that most of it they'll be evaporating off because there's so much water. Because it's back once you dig a huge hole, all the aquifer pours into it. It backfills. So all these wells are going to run dry because. Suddenly, there's a huge pit, and it's gonna, and it's going to take years to fill up. Anyways, it's a total disaster, but it sh it's a good example of how everything's interrelated. All these issues are connected. So I think about people and the connection. It's like if you take people out of it, it's it you know it's a critical link in connecting all these things. And um, I had another thing I was going to say about people, but 
Yeah, that's about it. Yeah. <laughs> I like thinking about your new self-portrait as the James Michael. <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, <laughs> hey, that's good. We have a question here. <laughs> Actually, it's more of a comment, uh, but uh, I'm a I'm a teacher. Uh, I teach about sustainability, and I just really appreciated the way uh, each of you addressed that challenge of reaching people and the balance of the positive and the negative mm -hmm. that you try to strike in your work. And um, that's something that I'm thinking about all the time. Mm -hmm. And I, I have such a responsibility to cultivate hope and yet to inform uh, high school students of the situation that we face, that they face. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just really uh, interesting to, so uh, Chrissy, you're look, you was, were looking at extinction and now your, your newer work is kind of going more in a positive direction that I can't quite remember how you articulated it, but I remember that last line of the last poem that you read about Carl continues to exist. Mm -hmm. um, and, and James, you just talk, you talked about it too in terms of how much to bludgeon your audience <laughs> with facts. And I just really appreciate the chance to think about this in different media than I'm usually working with. That's beautiful. Um, do you all want to speak to that? Or do you, we think that's a nice note to, I feel like that was also a beautiful note to end on. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, one thing I yeah. want to say that yeah. I was—I think my other thought came back to me a little bit. It was just that um, the other night of the meeting that, mm -hmm. that no one else knows about, but we had this meeting <laughs> through this water future waters program, and we had two guests on there, and one of them was um, Samantha Quap from the Sound Rivers. We heard about a little bit earlier, um, but um, the other was uh, Matt Gladick, who works for basically the Chamber of Commerce for Durham for downtown Durham, and his presentation. He had an interesting. Thing that he said, where he he he, he made an analogy to rain. He mm -hmm. said, if you pretend that he's like development will happen. He was a pro development guy because he was for the chamber, you know. But he's like, if you pretend like it's not going to rain, all of your hard work is just going to get washed away with everything else. Development will happen. So either you can have a, a role in it or not. And so by pretending it's not there, it's not doing anyone any service. And um, and so yeah, I mean, I I think that it's a it's an interesting thing to keep in mind. You have to be aware of the context that you're creating art in. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, there's also a very, it's kind of side People track need here. houses. They need houses. Yeah. <laughs> and also, nobody wants to be pointed a finger at and told they're like an idiot or something. Because like that's, mm -hmm. you need to, if you show people that you, that you understand them, you might have a chance at, at uh, uh, like mm -hmm. reaching them. But if you're just, and I see this across the board from every side, both sides, you know, like my own family, it's like, it's so tempting to just be like, oh, these people that are just, oh, uh, you, know, they're, <laughs> you know, they're idiots, you know, but it's, it's, if someone's called an idiot, they're not going to come to the table and sit down and talk to you about mm -hmm. it. And so I, it doesn't, it doesn't serve any purpose to do that. And so yeah. it's complicated stuff. Yeah. We did have, yeah, there was some, some very beautiful aligning of missions with the urban planner and the News River Keeper on our, on our call. It was, it was heartening, <laughs> I will say. Um, thank you all so much. Um, let's have a final round of applause for James and Christy. And, um, and please finish the snacks, mingle with each other before you go. And I am going to put that piece of paper on the back table in case you want to put your email address down if you'd like to get more information about the hearing on Monday. Um, and also, Christy has books for sale over there, and you can speak to her directly about purchasing those. I bet she would sign them for you. And there's also um, cards over there with information about James's solo show that's up right now. So thank you. Thank you so much for yes. coming, and yes. please come yeah. back it's on April 6th for our final Living Future Saturday of the spring. Two hours away. It's north. You would have been, you passed it on your way on the train. <laughs> <laughs>